Have you ever sat staring at an equation like this, wondering how to solve it? This is an example of what is known as a rational equation. That is, the thing on the left-hand side is a ratio of two functions of x. So it has the form p of x over q of x equals zero. To guide us in how to solve an equation like this, I want to go right back to your very early days of arithmetic, when you first learned about fractions. Here are a couple of fractions. Actually, they are still rational functions. They just happen to be rational functions where the top and the bottom are both constants. Do you remember some terms we applied to these fractions? The top we called the numerator, and the bottom we called the denominator. If we were asked to read out these fractions, we would say 2 fifths and 13 elevenths. Let's think about those two words again, the denominator and the numerator. First of all, the denominator. It has to do with denomination. In Latin, nomen means name. In other words, the things on the bottom of the fraction are naming the kind of object. In the first one, it's fifths. In the second one, it's elevenths. They're the name of the object. On the other hand, think of the word numeral. Numeral is a number. So the numerator tells us the number of the kinds of object. In the first one it's fifths and there are two of them. In the second fraction it's elevenths and there are thirteen of them. Suppose we wanted to have a number of elevenths equal to zero. Okay, the number of elevenths. That means the numerator. The only way we can have a number of elevenths equal to zero is to have none of the elevenths. In other words, the solution of this equation is a equals zero. Notice that I haven't tried to set the bottom, the denominator, equal to zero. Eleven equals zero just wouldn't make sense. It's this that gives us the clue how to solve our first equation, the one at the top in black that's starting to disappear off the screen. It's the numerator that has to be zero. The thing on the bottom is the denominator, x squared minus 3x minus fourths if you like. The number of them is the numerator on top. So if we want that ratio to be zero, then we have to set the numerator to zero. It is never right to try and set the denominator to zero in such a ratio. In fact, if the denominator were zero, the whole ratio would not be well defined because you can't divide by zero. So let's go back now to our first equation and solve it. Solving it will mean separating the top. That will be a quadratic. When we set that to zero, we'll have a quadratic equation. x squared minus 5x plus 6 equals zero. Let's write that out. Here I've chosen the coefficients so that it factorizes easily. Once we've factorized it, we can write down the solution straight away. Here, x equals 2 or 3. These are, in fact, the right solutions to the rational equation that I wrote down before. But there is something we ought to check. It's a subtlety, but it's necessary. We need to substitute x equals 2 or 3 into the denominator and make sure that it doesn't disappear with those values. If that did accidentally happen, then we'd be in a slightly different situation, and we would not have a solution to our equation. Let's go back and look at that denominator. x squared minus 3x minus 4. Actually, I've chosen this one to factorise easily as well. Once we've factorised it, we can easily see that it won't disappear when x is 2 or 3. And so 2 and 3 are the solutions to our equation in this case. In passing, though, we might also notice that x equals 4 or x equals negative 1 does make the denominator disappear. That would put 0 underneath. That's telling us that 4 and negative 1 should not be in the domain of this function. I probably should have written that up at the top in the first place. I'll go back and do it in a moment. x equals 4 and x equals negative 1 happen to be vertical asymptotes for the graph of this function. Vertical asymptotes usually arise when the denominator is 0. There is one exception, and we'll address that in a moment. But first, I just wanted to add that piece of information that the denominator should not be 0. I've done that now. 
So it remains to address the question as to what happens if some value of x makes both the numerator and the denominator zero. Let's look at an example. Here's one. Let's factorize the two quadratics. Notice that when x is 2, y is quite clearly 0. That would be a solution of y equals 0. The value x equals 4 is also of interest. It makes the denominator 0, without the numerator being 0. That means x equals 4 is a non-allowed point for this function, and there will be a vertical asymptote at x equals 4. The real problem point here is when x is 1. That will make y 0 over 0. That's another meaningless expression. It's telling us that x equals 1 is also not in the domain of this function. So it can't be a solution of y equals 0. So there I've added it to the non-allowed points. x is not allowed to be 4 or 1. But what does happen if x is very close to 1? If x is very close to 1, but not actually equal to 1, then the function is allowed, and we can cancel the factors of x minus 1. So long as x is never actually equal to 1, then y is equal to x minus 2 over x minus 4. In fact, let's change that to equals. Remember, x is allowed to get as close as we like to 1, as long as it doesn't actually reach it. That means we could substitute 1 into this new version of y. And we will then understand what value y gets close to when x is close to 1. Substituting 1 gives negative 1 over negative 3. That simplifies to a third. We can write this statement as a limit statement. In fact, we say that the limit of this function as x approaches 1 is the value 1 third. It wasn't really my intention to go too deeply into the discussion of limits here. I was more interested in showing you how to solve the rational equation. But I did have to mention this possibility, because it does happen. When x gets near to 1, it looks as though the numerator disappears, and the rational equation is solved. But actually, that's not the case, because 1 is not permitted in the domain of the function. So it can't be a solution to the rational equation. In this case, the only solution was x equals 2. All of what I've said works for any functions p over q. It's always the p of x that must be set to 0, if p over q is to equal 0. It's never anything to do with the denominator. That was the point I really wanted to make here. So in summary, to solve p of x over q of x equals 0, you solve just p of x equals 0, and then you make sure that that value of x that you get does not also make q equal to 0. If you're unfortunate enough to find that the solution of p equals 0 does also make q equals 0, then you're in the situation where you've got to investigate the limit of that value of x. A well-known example of this happening is the function sine x over x equals 0. The solution of this equation is x equals a whole number of pi, any whole number, so long as we don't choose 0 x equals 0 doesn't work, because that would put 0 on the bottom. In fact, the limit as x goes to 0 of sine x over x is 1, and 0 is not a well-defined point for this function. It's not in the domain. That concludes my presentation on this topic.